I am Dr. Shaw McFate, and I am a professor of war. Today's case study will be the Israel Hezbollah War of 2006. It is a 33 day conflict between the state of Israel, a non state actor, Hezbollah, on the territory of a third state, Lebanon, which was a wall for this conflict. This creates unique strategic challenges that mark the ongoing changing character of modern warfare. Hence, it's important that we take a look at it. It may be the future of war. Now, this conflict has many names, often depending on what side of the border that you live. It's known internationally sometimes as the 2006 Lebanon War. In Lebanon, it's called the July War. In Israel, it's called the Second Lebanon War. Why does this case study matter? One, it's indicative of the changing character of war, a conflict again between Israel, a state power and its powerful military, against a non-state actor, Hezbollah, on the territory of another state, Lebanon, that was not participant to this conflict. It also tests the placidity of regular versus irregular warfare concepts. I mean, are these terms even valid anymore? Rather than saying regular versus irregular, maybe we should just think about armed conflict as a spectrum of some sort. It showcases how globalization matters and information dominance can win wars. We live in an information age where information overmatch may be more relevant to victory and defeat than tactical, you know, kinetic overmatch like tanks and airplanes and so forth. Globalization itself is not a new phenomenon, but in the last 30 years, of course, the scope and velocity of information traveling around the world and how it impacts societies and perceptions of reality, that has changed in significant matter. We'll see how one actor uses globalization and information as an instrument of power. It also questions the overall relevancy of conventional war. Think about Clausewitz and Jomini, who still have a place, but perhaps their place is being eclipsed by other strategic thinkers. It also questions the laws of war. How relevant are they to this day and the utility of force in contemporary conflicts? In, in you know, 100 years ago, force was king. That's how you won wars. Today, having the best force, you know, violent force, doesn't seem to guarantee you victory in the ways it used to. Why is that? It demonstrates that there are many ways to win, not just on battlefields. We'll look at who won this war and why. It may be a surprise to some of you. And lastly, it explains how to win against democracies fighting a limited war. I am not advocating these strategies personally. I'm exploring them with you uh, so we know how this works. We know how democracies are vulnerable. And this is a, a, a strategy was used in this war that uses democracy against itself. The road to war. Now, the, as you all know, history is a contested topic. There are histories of history, and no more so than in the state of Israel. There's a Palestinian history book, there's an Israeli history book, and Israel history books go back to prehistory, which is, some would say, an oxymoron. Uh, others would say that's the Jewish homeland. So let's go back just into the last 100 years or so. This, the Israel Hezbollah war, it comes out of this cauldron of political contestation, as you all know. It began actually as a figment in the imagination of Jews who were suffering from pogroms in Eastern Europe. If you look to the right there on that screen, in for hundreds of years in Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, 
Uh, every now and then, authorities of states, uh, kings, czars, would allow the population to ransack, rape, and pillage, and murder Jews. It was sanctioned mass atrocity. Um, they called them programs, and they were increasingly brutal towards the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Its roots are in deep anti-Semitism that goes back uh, throughout the Middle Ages, which is its own topic for another time, the roots of anti-Semitism. The Jews wanted a way out of this. Um, and this idea of the reigning ideology of the 19th century in Europe was nationalism. Nationalism. Um, and Zionism is Jewish nationalism. So just to be clear, Zionism is not the same thing as Judaism. Sometimes Zionists blur that line deliberately. Zionism is Jewish nationalism. And it was particularly uh, talked about by thought leaders like Herzl. So Herzl was a German Jewish uh, journalist who wrote an essay on Zionism and, and recapturing Israel in the current land of Palestine that was owned, if you will, by the Ottomans. Um, and he helped convene the first sort of Zionist council in, in 1898, and they sent a delegation down to Palestine to sort of do a reconnaissance. Can we really make a Jewish homeland in Palestine, our home, you know, our Jewish, Israel is the Jewish homeland. Um, and they, they telegraphed this back, saying the bride is beautiful, but married to another. Meaning that Palestine was gorgeous, but it was under the rule of the Ottomans. Over time, some Jews emigrated to Palestine, but not many. Um, during the world, during World War II and thereafter, Israel or Palestine fell into the hands of the United Kingdom, which was which was one of the victors of World War One. The Ottoman Empire was not, and they gave up a lot of their territory to French and to England, according to the Sykes-Picot line. And later on, the Ottomans uh, underwent their own revolution. By, um, as you all know from Adam and Turk. So the Balfour Declaration was declared in 1917 in London. It said basically that England supports the idea of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Uh, and Palestine, at this point in the interwar years between World War I and World War II, was ruled by the British. It was called the British Mandate. Now, towards the end of that time, from 1936 to 1939 or 40, there was a large Palestinian um, insurgency against the British Mandate. And then, and then World War II broke out, and British basically stopped focusing on the insurgency and was all in on World War II. During, you know, after World War II ended, Britain returned to Palestine. They, they never quite left, but their focus was diverted to winning World War II. Um, and there's a, a the, the delicate demographic range of Palestinian Arabs to Jews was being massively disrupted by the waves and waves of Jewish refugees leaving Europe, refugees from the Holocaust, and they wanted some place to settle, and it was Israel. Israel. And they launched their own terrorist campaign against the uh, Palestinians. The British tried to put it down. They could not. They said, you know, enough of this. We're losing our empire around the world. We don't want to get in the middle of this feud between um, Israeli, Jew, you know, between Jews and and um, Palestinians. They even turned back, in order to preserve the stability of demographic equality, they even turned away refugee ships of Jews, which of course became a, an international media disaster for London. Um, the world at that point was horrified by the Holocaust, much of which was unknown to the world during the war. The Germans hid it. Um, now it was in full view, 
and Jews were given a certain amount of moral authority. And during the 1946, 47, around 1947 also, President Truman was engaged in a bitter election campaign in the United States, and he rushed to, um, to recognize Israel as its own new nation state in order to win Jewish votes and other Jewish sympathizer votes in the United States of America. Now, when Truman did this, he ignored agreements to consult Arab countries in the region. Uh, the United States had made that agreement to that. He ignored it and said, hey, they are a state. And the USSR promptly followed Truman and said, yep, they are a state. And this be- and this gave momentum to the insurgency of Jews in 1946 and 1947. Finally, the British said, enough's enough. Um, they hand the whole brewing conflict over to an embryonic United Nations. Now, this is, can you imagine this? The, the United Nations, it's in its infancy. It's just been declared the year before. And now this is their first homework assignment, solve Palestine. And as you can imagine, it was a complete pig's breakfast. On the left here, on this map, was their proposed uh, partition plan. They wanted to separate the two populations, Jews from Pal- from Arabs, Palestinians, and they and the white here in this map would be the Jewish state, and the amber would be the Arab states. Now, not only is this Swiss cheese of a country. Um, but the Arabs loudly complain and with some justification that, hey, you're giving all the best territory to the minority of the population, which is Jewish. And this is so outrageous that we're not even going to entertain it. Go back to the drawing board and do a better job. Meanwhile, um, the Jews said, hey, we won the UN negotiation, woohoo! So Arabs move out of these territories that say the Jewish state. And the Arabs said, no, thank you. And this led to war, uh, the first war of 1948. And this war, which is not studied much now, Israel waged a war of terror and some might even say genocide. I'm not saying that, but it has been said before. Basically, they would massacre the militia and the military under David Ben-Gurion would massacre uh, Arab civilians and Arab children. Uh, And then uh, and it became so serious that around 700,000 Arabs fled, um, fled Palestine. You know, leaving all their furniture, leaving all their possessions, they just quickly packed and left. Um, And this was called the Exodus of 1948, uh, or perhaps 1947. Um, Then Israel waged a war of conquest, and they used a lot of hand-me-down weapons from England. So the England said, hey, we we won World War II. We don't need these spitfires. Here you go, uh, young Israel. Use them. And they did. So Israel, the, the first... Israeli Defense Force, if you will, the first military, waged a a war of conquest to conquer all the amber areas on this map. When it was all said and done, uh, Egypt, they, they seized most of Israel. Today we call Israel. Egypt occupied the Gaza Strip. Jordan occupied uh, what previously the the British called Transjordan area, which we call today the West Bank. Um, These borders remain still. As you know, these borders are contested. Israel went on to fight three more wars with Arab countries. And during this time frame in 1962, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, was founded um, and it led another war uh, of terrorism inside of Israel against Israelis, uh, Zionists and Jews. Um, Now, they initially, the PLO was initially based out of Jordan. But one of the interesting secret histories of Jordan is in the early 1970s, the Jordanians, first of all, didn't really integrate the Palestinians. 
and then kick the PLO out because the PLO was making life difficult for the Jordanians. The PLO would would uh, go launch terrorist attacks inside of Israel. Then they go across the border to their safe haven in Jordan. Remember T.E. Lawrence talking about how insurgents need a safe haven, especially across a border where the enemy's military could not legally cross. Um, and this created all sorts of friction between Jordan and between Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. And finally, the Jordanians were out. Go get out of here, PLO. And the PLO went to Lebanon. They went to Lebanon. Now, they use Lebanon as a staging ground for further terrorist attacks. Now, Lebanon itself descended into a brutal civil war from 1975 to 1990. This was a, a horrific war that's now tragically forgotten by many people outside of the Middle East. It was a total war on the ground of Lebanon. Its roots are complex, like any civil war. Um, but many external powers, you know, got involved in this war. You know, there, there many tentacles had made this way into the war. And Israel was no different. Israel supported certain militias in the war, tried to, and and so, and Syria did as well. So Israel was supporting the Christian Maronite um, population. Um, Syria and Iran were, so, well, mostly Syria was supporting um, the Shia, which is the precursor, the, some of them are precursors to Hezbollah, and there, of course, were Sunni. Um, this war ended ends in 1990, but before it ends, Israel, as many people discover when they start to try to manipulate events on the ground in a complex civil war, gets sucked into the war. And in 1980, uh, 1982, Israel says, enough with the covert operations, we're actually going to invade. Uh, and they invade southern and occupy southern Lebanon. Why southern Lebanon? Because the PLO and other militias were using it as a safe haven to launch attacks into northern Israel. So remember, the PLO moved from Jordan, who was tired of that, into Lebanon. And southern Lebanon at this time was sort of a wild, wild west without much governance. And so Israel was tired of guerrilla warriors coming over the mountains in northern Israel. And they said, we have, to, we have to go into southern Lebanon, occupy and create a security buffer zone. And so they did. And this is why they, this is the first Lebanon war from Israel's point of view in 1982. Um, now, during this time as well, it's the U.S. also was involved in this. And this is when Hezbollah makes its entrance is in 1982. Um, and Hezbollah deliberately goes after uh, American targets, which we'll talk about. So after the war concludes in 1990, Israel's strategic posture shifts. It focuses less on threatening Arab states, which had all seemed by that point to cool with other issues going around the Middle East. And uh, and there were no more sort of wars against Israel, at least not directly. Um, and, they, and Israel's main national security concern was terrorism by the PLO, by Hezbollah, terrorist, Arab terrorist uh, groups, fighting in, you know, sort of insurgency-like tactics, using terrorism, the Antifadas, blowing up buses in downtown Tel Aviv, uh, killing people in downtown Jerusalem. This became the focus of the Israeli military and security forces. And by in 2000, they said, you know, why are we even still in Lebanon? It's just a huge resource suck for Israel. And they don't, there's no real threat coming from Lebanon. So let's take those resources, pull those troops back. We can say we've won. And they did. In 2000, Israelis marked it like a victory, a huge uh, celebration. No victory parades, but um, it, was, it was seen as a victory. Until six years later, they invade into Lebanon all over again. And that's where we start with today. And here is a picture to your right of Beirut after this war. Parts of Beirut looked like Stalingrad. It was brutal. 
All right, so before we go further, let's examine Israeli grand strategy. Their grand strategy has been consistent throughout the lifetime of the state of Israel. And it's actually based on an article, an essay written in 1923 by Jabotinsky. It's called The Iron Wall. And this Iron Wall was later adapted by David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister and sort sort of like the George Washington of Israel. So here's the prime, here's the grand strategy, at least a synopsis of it. So Israel, as you know, is a very small state, maybe about the size of Maryland, and a small population. Its population is less, there's less Israelis than people who live in New York City, right? And owing to this, uh, and also they are surrounded by adversaries with their back to the ocean. They view themselves like an island nation, which is true. They they're not only are surrounded by adversaries, but they have an island economy. Uh, they do more trade with Europe than with the Middle East. They've always viewed themselves as in the bunker. So given their small size and small populations, the Israeli Defense Force, which is their military, the IDF, must, one, they can only fight a limited war. I mean, a limited duration of war. It could be a total war, but they, they can't, afford a protracted war. They have to, because they don't have enough resources. So that means they have to take the fight to the enemy. They have to seize the initiative and move into enemy territory as quickly as possible. So it this grand strategy overall is offensive. Well, it's defensive overall, meaning that we don't throw the first punch, but we throw the last punch. And if you do punch us, we are immediately going to go on the offensive. And we have to, due to strategic constraints of our location and our the resources we have on hand. Second is that they need to also launch in an expeditionary manner into enemy territory to give themselves defense in depth. So the idea here is you in, you kind of like blitzkrieg, uh, if you will, uh, into into Syria or into Lebanon, and then you then do retrograde operations using sort of even guerrilla warfare tactics to delay and delay the invasion force, doing spoiling attacks, and you're buying time to mobilize the rest of your country. Israel is practiced at mobilizing their entire country. It is a total war. And this buys time for the counteroffensive. And third and lastly is that they want to achieve escalation dominance with a cumulative deterrent effect. What this means is that they maintain an overwhelming military supremacy in their region as a deterrent. So if you remember Great Britain's grand strategy, it relied on having naval supremacy because they are an island nation who got wealth from their colonies. They had, Everything depended on them being able to secure their island and their, and their trade. This is something similar. It's an analog, at least, where the Israel's military dominance uh, if they're able to wipe out, as they have in 56, uh, 67, and 73, they're able to uh, wipe out the enemy, this serves as a deterrent. Don't even try. And if you do try to to hit us, we are going to res- respond in a disproportionate way. So forget about the laws of war. If you hit us with a, mach- with a knife, we're not going to come after you with a 9 millimeter pistol we're going to come after you with multiple bazookas. And they do that. And they they need to seek a quick and decisive victory as soon as possible, getting back to number one here. So again, it's sort of this idea is that we may not throw the first punch, but we will throw the last. And this is the this is the effect they want their grand strategy to have, not just on their own domestic population, but on their neighbors too. So here is what they're trying to communicate If you think of wars armed politics, this is their communication. They're trying to convince their enemies that the quest to destroy Israel is useless. They will do all these things, whether it's, you know, uh, popular in the international press, whether it violates the laws of war, they do not care. They will do this as a matter of survival and total war. And they've maintained this strategy since its founding in 48, and it's Has it worked out well for them? I leave that for you to discuss. 
Okay, now let's go to Hezbollah. Now this has many names, Hezbollah, but it's often mispronounced. It's more like Hezbollah. Uh, and Western and other Israeli leaders tend to deliberately mispronounce it just to irritate them. Um, in some ways, George Bush 41 did the same thing in the in 1991 Gulf War. Rather than saying Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein he would say Saddam uh, Hussein is in Sodomite. Um, and it's sort of, you know, you could say it's kind of childish. You could say it's effective and why not do it? Leave that for you to decide. So what is Hezbollah? I'm going to pronounce it Hezbollah. That's how it's pronounced right or wrongly in the United States today. It is a Shiite Muslim organization. It was founded during the Civil War in 1982. It means party of God. That's what it means. And it's based in Lebanon. And it's many see it, I think correctly, as a proxy militia for Iran. And if you remember before uh, the war in Syria, I, Iran and uh, Syria were Shiite powers, even though most people in Syria were, the only minority of them were Shia, the leadership, fam, the family, of uh, the Bashir, etc., I mean, uh, the leader, the president, they're Alawites, which is a sort of a branch of Shia. So, and this creates what a king of Jordan once called the Shia Crescent across the Middle East from Iran through Syria into Lebanon. And the, the party in Lebanon was Hezbollah or is Hezbollah. So Hezbollah is based in Lebanon, seen as a proxy of Iran. They are an armed political power. We will discuss that soon, what that means. And they are a potent fighting force. These are not uh, bedraggled, uh, you know, warriors in sort of overweight, in camouflage, carrying AR-15s, you know, climbing the U.S. Capitol. These are lean and mean, organized, skilled and trained and equipped warriors. According, this is according to one Israeli general, but I think it sums up what most Israelis, they, they, say, they size up Hezbollah as a serious threat. It has the structure, organization, and capability of a regular army. It's not just a flat organization uh, that you see that guerrillas often have, whether it be a Maoist insurgency or uh, a T.E. Lawrence one. They have hierarchy. They have the logic of a terrorist organization and the MO of a guerrilla group. And they blend these strategies quite well, which is one of the reasons that this is an interesting case study and that others around the world are trying to emulate Hezbollah in some effect because Hezbollah has been relatively successful. Now, they came on the scene in 1982 in the middle of a bloody civil war in Lebanon with a bang and not a tweet. They went after uh, United States first. And that's clever. They were like, how do we strip? How do we get the superpower out of our backyard? Well, if we take them on head on, we will lose. But if we use terrorism as a strategy, we can win. And that's what they did. They infamously captured the CIA station chief of Beirut, tortured him brutally to death. Um, they assassinated Americans in, the, in Beirut. For example, I think the head of a, the local American private school. And then famously or infamously in 1983, they bombed the U.S. Marine barracks in Beirut, killing 241 Marines. Now, Reagan, it turns out, proves that he, despite his tough talk, was nothing but a glass jaw and immediately pulled all U.S. troops out of Lebanon, which is a huge win for Hezbollah. And they did it using terrorism, which later inspired Osama bin Laden. There are prices you pay for actions that you take. Right. And later, and this was also emulated by Al Qaeda in 2004. So in 2004, look at places like Spain. They were part of the US's, quote, coalition of the willing to go into Iraq, to go into Afghanistan. And uh, Al Qaeda said, we want, how do we get countries like Spain out of this place? How do we strip the United States 
of their allies. Well, what they did is they did terrorism and played armed politics. They blew up a bunch of commuter trains in Madrid, and this sparked huge outrage amongst the Spanish population who said, like, why are we even in Iraq? That's not Spain's fight. And so the government of Spain, under pressure from its people, pulled out of Iraq, pulled out of Afghanistan. This shows you the the the, the tactics and the strategies of Sun Tzu, uh, which is what this is, work. So rather than committing a you know a hundred thousand men to getting you know, the U.S. a superpower out of your backyard or whatever size you need in a straight on head to head fight, if you're cunning and devious and yes unethical, you can you can achieve your objective. You can achieve your objective. So this is what Hezbollah did. And ever since 1982, they have been a huge thorn in the side of Israel, one of Israel's main threats. No longer Arab countries, it's Hezbollah. Now, Hezbollah plays armed politics. They know that war is armed politics. They think strategically, which means they understand that military victories translate into strategic ones and vice versa at the strategic level of war and wars are won at the strategic level of war and this is how they think they model themselves on the irish republican army the ira which has two separate wings a political wing and a military wing so the in the ira its political wing is Sinn fein it's a political party and in hezbollah it's called the loyalty to the resistance bloc and this political party in 2006 had like, you know, I've got 11% of the seats in parliament. They were seen as a legitimate party and they are seen today as a legitimate party. And they also have a military wing called the Jihad Council. These are the, their paramilitaries are not statutory forces in Lebanese armed forces. Um, Israel considers them terrorists. Lebanon does not. Um, and it's an interesting question. Like, what are they? They're, they're a political party has its own armed forces. Is this like Nazi brown shirts? I mean, how should we think about that? Um, but this is the situation then, and this is the situation today. And think about it too. If you are on the other side, like, you know, in Great Britain, they're like, how should we think about recognizing Sinn Féin even? We know that they're tied to terrorists, even though that they claim there's a firewall between the, you know, the IRA and Sinn Féin, which they know is complete BS, right? And same here with the loyalty of the resistance bloc and the Jihad Council. There's no firewall. So talk, you know, so how how should Leban how do you think Lebanon should approach this problem? And is there utility to the government of Lebanon to actually, you know, including, do you want, for example, Hezbollah, to put it crassly, do you want Hezbollah in the tent pissing out or outside the tent pissing in, right? There, there may be utility to this arrangement as well. Also, Hezbollah runs social services mostly in southern Lebanon, which is where most of the Shia live. And remember, they're a Shia organization. And it's also the poorest part of Lebanon. And so they run their own social services. And in some ways, for those who are social contract theorists, they're reaffirming their social contract to the Shia people that they claim to represent. So and here's a logo. And if you see that logo, the, the cupped hands with Hezbollah type uh, and UN type colors, that's riffing off of the, you know, UNHCR's branding. They are appropriating the, or using the memes of UNHCR, which is the United Nations, um, basically human rights wing. And, and think about that. How are they appropriating these images and memes for their own strategic objectives? Images and symbols matter, right? When you, especially when you have to craft narrative. Uh, to the right, you see you can donate. And there's all sorts of plans that are institutionalized for you to donate. You have a Adopt the Jihad Fund. You have Donate to the Martyrs Children Fund. You have Equip a so uh, Fighter Fund. Um, you can buy some rockets and you get a nice receipt. 
I don't know if it's tax deductible in Lebanon, but it's actually quite formalized. This is not just people running around with their hat out collecting me, you know, uh, alms or, or shaking people down, which they may do. Uh, and also they use the Lebanese commercial diaspora around the world to solicit funding. Uh, as you know, Lebanese throughout history, throughout prehistory, have always been supreme business leaders. Right? The, it's like it's in Lebanese DNA. I don't know from the Phoenicians to Lebanese today. If you go to West Africa, there's a whole Lebanese mercantile class in the Caribbean, in Africa, uh, in Central America, and some of these are also ways that Hezbollah attracts support and resources. Some have called Hezbollah a state within a state. It has its own political party, its own social services, its own, uh, you know, army, if you will, its own foreign relations with uh, Iran and Syria. And you can make a strong case it's a state within a state. And this leads many around the world to question, like, you know, maybe what is its legitimacy? There are, some say it's a terrorist organization. Others say it's not a terrorist organization, and most just say maybe. We don't know. And you can imagine who says it's terrorist, especially the United States and Israel. And Israel has a special relationship to the United States, which I encourage you in discussion to explore. Why is the U.S. Um, so have a special relationship with a country that causes arguably a lot of problems for United States foreign policy in the Middle East? And the, Israel is a country where it's less than this. You know, there are more people who live in New York City than in Israel. So why is the U.S. going out of its way to support Israel? At, you know, giving a political top cover, giving it uh, military arms, you know, $10 billion worth of military arms, all these things, uh, you know, and it's it's a big question mark, right? What, others would argue Israel is an indispensable ally, an irreplaceable ally in the world, especially the Middle East. What are the roots of the special relationship? Uh, some say Israel is a bad ally. Some say it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a critical ally. Explore that. Others, like obviously Iran and Russia, recognize Israel, I mean, recognize Hezbollah as a legitimate group. It's a political party. But most people in the world, like China, say, we don't know. Frankly, maybe we don't care. It doesn't really impact us that much. All right, now on to the war. Now, many wars have a triggering event. They have all the material, all the re factors for war are already there. Think of them like a big wood pile that's a full of dry wood doused in kerosene and jet fuel. And somebody comes along with a match and drops it on that pile and poof, it all goes up in war. Uh, think of this as the, how World War I started. It had a triggering event, the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo. And he was the number two, you know, the, the crown prince, if you will, of the Habsburgian throne. And all the elements were there for war. And if it wasn't that trigger event, it could have been, well, another trigger event. And, it could, and the same could be said for this war in 2006. So let's do a quick map orientation. Here is Lebanon. It's surrounded on the north and to the east by Syria. And for many years, Syria, you could say, was a, uh, an overlord of of politics in Lebanon. Um, they went in in 1975 and 1976. They sent troops into the, the early, the first year of the civil war in Lebanon as an emergency and then never bothered to leave. And it wasn't until the assassination um, in 2005 of a, of a very popular Lebanese prime minister that people in Lebanon said, enough's enough, you need to leave now. And they, they did. And of course, then uh, the Arab Spring happened and the Syrian civil war and Syria now is basically a dumpster fire. Um, to the south of Lebanon is Israel. And it shares a narrow border. And of course, like uh, Israel, uh, the Mediterranean is the entire western border. So let's go down to the southern portion. Um, so again, Lebanon 
was not an enemy or party to this war. It's rather its territory is where the, the battle is where the war was fought. But Lebanon was not a belligerent. It was not participatory to the war. And one question is, where was Lebanon? Was it AWOL? Where was its armed forces? Were they just sitting in their barracks? The answer is yes, but why? So encourage you to think about that as well. And what would you do if you were Beirut? All right, focusing in on the border of Israel and Lebanon. So this circle is sort of where the incident took place that we'll talk about. But just in general, Lebanon, southern Lebanon, first of all, it's a mountainous region. It's a, a depopulated region. It's probably one of the poorest regions of Lebanon, if not the poorest region. And since the 1970s, terrorist groups, insurgent groups like the PLO, Hezbollah and others have been using it as a safe haven to attack Israel. They shoot rockets or mortars over the border. Uh, they launch incursions across the border and do raids and ambushes and go, again, go across the border. Again, think of your T. Lawrence. You know, insurgents or raiders need a safe haven, preferably in a foreign state that is sympathetic to the insurgents' cause. And that's and the reason you do that is because the army of Israel cannot legally go across the border. So you can run across the border and thumb your nose at the Israeli Defense Force and they can't follow you. They can't even shoot you. So that's why southern Lebanon has been a safe haven for terrorist organizations against Israel for 50 years. So in this one little area is where the whole war started by accident. This is almost, almost accidental warfare. So what happened is there were, uh, every day, uh, you know, Israeli patrols go up and down the border. And this day, July 12th, at 8 o'clock in the morning, 8.07 to be exact, two Israeli Humvees were patrolling the border. And they saw rockets scream overhead and impact a nearby village. So they immediately speed off towards the village to see if they can render assistance. And on the way to the village, they get ambushed by Hezbollah militia, Hezbollah fighters in Israel, in Israeli territory. And a gunfight happens, a firefight ensues, and several Israeli soldiers are, are killed and two Israeli soldiers are captured and abducted. And Israel sends in um, like a reserve platoon. There's even more of a there's more of a firefight. Um, more Israelis die. I think I'm not sure if Hezbollah dies, but Hezbollah then retreats across the border to Lebanon with these two abducted soldiers. That's how this all starts. And the rocket attack was just a deception plan to pull the two Humvees into the kill zone of the ambush. It was purely a deception plan. Now, we actually have footage now of the training for this mission in July 12, 2006 by the Hezbollah commander. Here's the actual, this is them doing a dress rehearsal for this, this specific attack. Previously unseen footage of the organization's preparations for the incident which triggered the war. A cross-border ambush of an IDF force on July 12, 2006, and the abduction of the bodies of two Israeli soldiers quickly led to a full-on conflict, which lasted 34 days. These are the two Israeli Hummers shortly before they were attacked. Good morning, everyone, one of the IDF soldiers says to his friends over a radio transmission. And these are rare images of Imad Murnia, the iconic former Hezbollah commander who is seen personally instructing Hezbollah militants as they drill an attack on IDF vehicles. Have someone shoot at the vehicle. Better to have two shooting from the same direction and keep shooting as it advances. Imad Murnia was killed in a mysterious explosion in Damascus about two years after this footage was shot. A strike. So that, mis that Hezbollah leader mysteriously vanished two years after this was released on public TV. Go figure. So what happened? How did this lead to a war? Hezbollah was simply trying to do a hostage exchange, which they had done many times in the past. They did not expect this to turn into an 
all-out war. So for the last 15 years, Hezbollah and others have been going cross-border to capture you know, uh, Israeli soldiers, and they would exchange them. One Israeli soldier is like 10 Hezbollah prisoners. And that's all they wanted to do that morning. And they had done that many times in the past. What they did not expect was Israel going into all-out war against Hezbollah. Israel's response was immediate. And it was, in some ways, uh, circumvented Israel's own laws because the prime minister, rather than going to the Knesset, which is Israel's, you know, sort of their Congress, their parliament, and having a discussion and declaring war, he told, he and the, the sort of minister of defense said, we're going to go to war now and explain later to our government what's going on. And so they launched, they, they started to in- escalate immediately. As Clausewitz would say, well, that's the nature of war. The nature of war is to escalate. And that's indeed what they did. Even when members of the Knesset and, and you know, Israel's own government didn't really even understand what was going on. So initially, this was Israel's strategic assessment of Hezbollah. They said, you know, Hezbollah will capitulate under the weight of an immediate and intensive military assault. And the reason they want to do this is because Hezbollah has been doing this for, you know, a decade and a half. It's the war of the flea. A little prick here, a little prick there. We've got to stop it. Enough's enough. We're going to go in there once and for all and wipe out Hezbollah. And they will succumb because they are just a guerrilla group and we have the best military in the Middle East. So they also knew they had a a strategic constraint, which was terrain, which is a friction. Now, the the border, for those who have not been there, southern, southern Lebanon and northern Israel are beautiful, but they're very hilly, very rocky. And if you're doing an armored, you know, division into southern Lebanon, what that does to to armor and to vehicles is it channels them into ambush zones. And Israel tasted that in 1982 in the first Lebanon war. And they knew it would happen again because Hezbollah and the IDF knew where exactly where every ambush zone was. But don't worry, Israel has a solution for that. Here are the ends. Uh, So basically, they want to finish Hezbollah as a fighting force in southern Lebanon. All right. They're like, enough's enough. Now, the prime minister, Omar, who escalated this whole thing, he went to the Knesset many days later. I forget how many days, but it wasn't the same day. He waited days. So this was actually in the news before he addressed the Knesset and he addressed the public. And what he did on live TV, he said, here are the four strategic objectives. We want to, one, we're going to get those two soldiers back. Two, we want a complete ceasefire permanently from Hezbollah from the north. And to do that, we want Hezbollah to withdraw from South Lebanon permanently. And fourth, they want to, they want to prompt the Lebanese government to take control of southern Lebanon. I mean, that's what you do in the society of states, the Westphalian order. The state is that entity which is presumed to have the monopoly of force in a territory to take control of its territory. And here you have another armed force running around your territory. It looks like a civil war. And Lebanon is basically a failed state from the viewpoint of Israel. It doesn't have control of its territory, and they want to see Beirut take control of its territory, or Israel will. And Israel has a solution for this, too. If you don't take control of your territory, we're going to hurt you. We're going to hurt you in some specific ways. What ways? These ways. They're going to launch a military and punitive approach or strategy, small s, to compel the enemy's will. This is a very much Clausewitzian strategic logic here. They're going to do airstrikes against Hezbollah. Airstrikes. Why airstrikes? Well, for several reasons. One, remember the ambush zones I talked about, about the hilly terrain and the how it channels armored columns? Well, if you strike them from the air, if you strike Hezbollah from the air, you don't have to deal with you know anybody ambushing your, your ground troops because there are no ground troops. 
Also, they were very much influenced by the U.S.'s Re revolution and military affairs debate in the 1990s, specifically something that comes out of it called effects-based operations. This is an idea that was being pushed by the U.S. Air Force in the 1990s and early 2000s that basically says using sophisticated military jets and precision munitions, you can actually hold land now. You can control land from the air. And, you know, they looked at as a case study, Kosovo Air Campaign of 1999, which looked to be a success. And the early days of the U.S. invasion in Iraq in 2003, if you remember Shock and Awe, that's another example of this, although it turns out Shock and Awe was... Uh, you know, imp impotent. It was just a very overpriced fireworks show in the air. Um, but that wasn't clear completely in 2006. And Israel was attracted to this for other reasons too, is that the U.S. and the U.S. share their special relationship also goes to a shared strategic culture, uh, faith in technology, um, you know, using things like uh, F-15s, as you can see here, these Israeli F-15s, and also that Israel, like the United States in the 2000s, had a population that didn't want to see Israeli soldiers coming home in body bags. That was a real big sensitivity for Israeli culture. And so if you could do it all from the air and not risk any more POWs getting captured or killed, so much the better from Jerusalem's point of view. So that's why airstrikes became the main weapon for this war for Israel. And also they were going to destroy a lot of Lebanese infrastructure as a punishment to Beirut, as a punishment to the government of Lebanon, saying like, see, this is what happens when you don't take control of your own territory. When you when you get us going, we're going to go in and we're going to punish you. And this is why it's called a punitive campaign. It's one of punishment. It also had some other operational art impacts too, which we'll talk about later, but it's primarily as, you know, a credible threat that's been delivered as promised. Like, hey, you didn't do anything about Hezbollah. We're going to, you know, if you won't take care of the problem, we'll take care of you. Now, their means for Israel is all military. It's all Klaus-Fitzian and Germanian logic. They're going to use the Air Force and its standoff firepower and precision strikes. What standoff means is that you have a, a, a jet and I don't, you know, and it can, it can say let loose a missile or a bomb from 10 kilometers away. And that's well beyond the range of any air defense artillery or any surface to air missiles. So basically, the Air Force gets to bomb Hezbollah and Hezbollah, they're out of the range of Hezbollah response. So it's a very safe way to win wars. Again, remember, Israel doesn't want to have any, not a single, single soldier coming back in a body bag for domestic political reasons. The Navy, the Israeli Navy is going to blockade Lebanon. And the army stood by in reserve only in case of emergency would they go in. They would have special forces on the ground covertly to sort of guide in uh, close air support. But that was the role. They were not going to do a, a ground invasion. So again, this is a very, you know, it's conventional strategy. It's Jominian Clausewitzian strategic logic. Chief of this is the mighty Merkava tank. The tank, this is an Israeli designed tank. It is one of the greatest tanks in the world. Uh, it means, Merkava means chariot, and it's it's the envy of the world. It's even a rival to the M1A1 A1 Abrams tank. Uh, it's one of the greatest tanks in the world, and it's become a symbol of Israeli might. Uh, and if you are in the Israeli army, the the most one of the most the, the biggest prestigious jobs in the Israeli armed forces is jet fighter pilot, tank driver, or special forces, right? And uh, and it's no wonder because if you look at the Arab Israeli wars, they were won with some tank battles, some big tank battles. All right, moving on to Hezbollah. Let's look at let's assess their their side. So their assessment of Israel is pretty spot on. They're like, Israel, well, not initially. They thought, there's no way Israel is going to go to war over these hostages, right? Two guys. They're not going to go to war over two guys. But they know that Israel's center of gravity is their military. And think about the Israeli grand strategy. Hezbollah says, yep, read you loud and clear, Liam and Charlie. And they, they also know, uh, perhaps better than Israeli politicians, that 
Israel has another strategic constraint besides terrain. It's Israeli society itself, and it's casualty averse. So here's a picture of Nasrallah. He is the leader of Hezbollah, has been the leader of Hezbollah since 1992. In After, the, after Israel withdrew from Lebanon in 2000 and, and declared victory, Nasrallah also declared victory and said, hey, we won. Israel left, even though Hezbollah didn't really have anything to do with it, uh, per se, not directly. Um, and then in the speech, which is very interesting, he says Israel's Achille heel is Israeli society itself. And that Israeli society is no, it's not what their forefathers used to be in the tough 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's now become like this effete you know, uh, post-war, brittle society that doesn't want to look at violence, doesn't want to fight anymore. They they like to talk tough, but actually they're weak, they're wimps, and they don't want to actually go to war. And so they can't really endure war anymore. And he knows this, and he's going to use that strategically against Israel. So Hezbollah's ends are these. Originally, again, it was just a prisoner swap, but as soon as they saw what was going on, they immediately pivoted strategically and said, okay, we're going to win, but we're going to win by not losing. Does this sound familiar? We're going to win by not losing. He said, the victory we're talking about is when the resistance survives. So survival is victory. And and that the victory and, and the defeated is, you know, we're not defeated as long as we're still standing. And it's true. I mean, this is how, this is Maoist strategic logic at work. It's Sun Tzu strategic logic at work. We saw this in the U.S.-American Revolutionary War. George Washington maintained the Revolutionary Army not to defeat the Redcoats. He knows that they would get creamed in an actual battle with the Redcoats. He kept the army around because he denies Britain their victory condition. Victory condition for Great Britain at the time was the revolution is dead. Well, can London declare the revolution dead as long as a a revolutionary army is still running around the countryside? No, they cannot. So again, this is the strategic level of war where military triumphs tr- convert into political triumphs and vice versa. And again, it's, it's again like um, Kissinger during the Vietnam War saying the big army loses if it does not win and the guerrilla wins if he does not lose. Nasrallah is saying the exact same thing here. He knows it. These are his ends. Hezbollah's ways is Mao. Protract the conflict. Again, deny Israel's victory objectives. You don't have to gain your victory objectives. You can win just by denying your enemy their victory objectives. And if you're the smaller power, David versus Goliath, you can kind of get away with that. And how hard is that to do? Just not return the prisoners or leave the area, right? Omer put out these four victory conditions on public TV, uh, international TV, and all you got to do is just deny one of them. How hard can that be? And also to attack the Israeli population centers because they don't, they're war weary. They don't want to go to war. They don't want to see dead soldiers come home in body bags. So, what happens if you take the war directly to them? And Nasrallah has a way to do that. And again, just to generally inflict pain, make the, the cost too high, and Israel will leave of its own accord. So, to bleed the IDF dry, not to defeat them. This is pure Mao. And Mao would say, hey, you're about to kick ass. And guerrilla, Hezbollah's means, they are, they are dug in, trained guerrilla force. These are not ragtags. These are not ISIS people getting off the plane from, you know, you're not from London. It's like, oh, I want to hear, I want to help. These are institutionalized guerrilla forces. It's almost an oxymoron. And they're dug in. Um, they also have short and medium range rockets anti-tank weapons, which they'll use to great effect at the strategic level of war. And they have pretty good communication systems and redundancy. It's not one of these cases where it's an insurgency run by, um, you know, mobile phones. And Israel Air Force just takes down some mobile phone towers and they can't talk to each other. They actually had 
redundancy, and they also have their own TV station, which we're going to discuss, which they weaponize fairly effectively. All right, the war itself lasts 33 days, 34, depending on who you talk to, how they count minutes. Uh, It's relatively short, but it's a significant war. So in the very first few days, it's a little bit like uh, U.S., what the U.S. did in Iraq in 2003. They decimate Lebanese infrastructure. And this is part of the punitive campaign against the government of Lebanon. Like, this is the, you brought this on yourself. We're going to set you back in the Stone Ages in terms of your infrastructure, and it's going to cost you a lot of money and take many years to fix. But it's also a counter-mobility campaign and counter-resupply campaign. So they, they want to stop... Um, you know, Hezbollah from transporting these two soldiers out of country into Syria onto a ship. And so they want to make it as difficult as possible for them to drive to a port a port of disembarkation. And remember that you know, Israel has complete air superiority. So if, they, if Hezbollah had a helicopter, I don't think they did, but they had one, it'd be blown out of the sky. So taking down bridges, key roads, actually there is operational sense to this strategy. And it also prevents resupply for Hezbollah forces in the south. To show you how how effective, you know, or how decimating the effects-based operations were initially, um, look at, this is a part of Beirut. This is, you know, airstrikes. This is This part of Beirut is sort of like the Hezbollah quarter, if you will. This is before the war. This is after the war. It looked like Stalingrad. Stalingrad. The Israeli Air Force pulverized it. It did not hinder the operations of Hezbollah. It did not, which had lots of redundancy, uh, lots of redundancy of comms, and didn't even stop the TV station. The studio was there. They had um, backup studios across the countryside. They even had a mobile TV studio. And they, throughout the war, they kept on broadcasting at the same hour, evening news, every day. All right. So almost immediately, Israel ran into problems. The first problem for Israel despite the pounding you just saw in Beirut, is they just learned what probably every grunt knows, is that air power alone cannot control ground reality. In fact, air power cannot control ground reality. And effects-based operations is really just theory in search of fact. As a result, after about two weeks, they had to send in ground troops to control Um, and occupy southern Lebanon, which they did not want to do, but they felt they had to at this point. But this created more problems than it solved. Strategic surprise. So ground troops went into southern Lebanon and expected to see a few hungry Hezbollah fighters in ragtag clothes and some some AK-47s, Instead, what they found was the Maginot Line. <laughs> they found, um, a, you know, like Iwo Jima conc- reinforced concrete tunnels, parapets, and others that gave uh, a few Hezbollah soldiers good overwatch and good coverage of avenues of approach. Of the, remember, we talked about how the terrain channeled incoming troops and vehicles. So a very a few amounts of of, of Hezbollah militants could safely hold back or retard the Israeli on-the-ground advance. This is what Israeli special forces said in testimony after this. We didn't know what hit us. We expected to find a tent and three Kalashnikovs. That's what the intel said. Instead, we found a hydraulic steel door leading to a well-equipped network of tunnels. So this was operational art failure. I mean, this was intelligence failure at an operational art level that really cost, had a strategic price for Israel because Hezbollah and Nasrallah were keen to exploit this problem, and they did. Also, remember the Hezbollah tank, the the pride and joy of Israel, the symbol of the tank uh, of Israeli might to the entire region, entire world? 
Well, Hezbollah had, you know, in addition to secretly digging in into southern Lebanon between 2000 and 2006, they were also secretly getting from Syria and and Iran Russian-made anti-tank missiles like TOEs. So again, here's the mighty Merkavab. It's the symbol of Israeli power. And as such, it's political. And here's what happens next. The problem was that in front of the Merkava was uh, little units, soldiers, foot soldiers, with anti-tank missiles. And even the Merkava couldn't handle the advance of the new anti-tank missile. Even the Merkava can't do it. The Israelis were surprised by Hezbollah's new weaponry. The modern Russian-made anti-tank missiles Hezbollah was using had been acquired from Syria and Iran. Hezbollah was using them with deadly effectiveness. The Lebanon war was going increasingly high-tech. Israel developed the Merkava and turned it into a symbol of Israeli military technology. It showed it off to all the armies of the world. It became a legend. And so, in response to this, Hezbollah acquired weapons with the aim of destroying the Merkava. They developed, and we developed too. And we surprised them. So again, here's an example where Israel is fighting a tactical and operational military war, and the enemy, Hezbollah, is fighting a strategic level war. They know that war at the strategic level is armed politics. So taking out a Merkava tank with these, anti- these, these tow missiles, if you will, it wasn't just a military win. It wasn't just a tactical win. It was a strategic win because this you were attacking the symbol of Israeli military power. An internationally recognized symbol, a symbol recognized by Israel itself. It's an attack on the Merkava, it's an attack on Israel successfully. And they use this, not just in, only in just in propaganda, but it demoralized the Israeli soldiers and completely moralized the, uh, if you will, uplifted the Hezbollah soldiers. Even though you know they lost about five, five tanks total were destroyed, but that was enough. That was enough. So again, after the war, here's one Israeli general. He said Hezbollah was ready, and the IDF was not. He said Hezbollah was ready at all three levels of war, the tactical, operational, and strategic. And he says, come on, look, you know, the Israeli Defense Force was was facing the equivalent of one commando battalion in the Syrian military. We've got to do better. So a ground war creates more problems for Israel in many ways. So an army now is invading and occupying southern Lebanon, uh, and this allows more targets, more the potential for more dead Israeli soldiers and more captured POWs. Meanwhile, Hezbollah is making mission creep for Israel. Hezbollah is successfully protracting the war. Israel thought this would be a quick and easy one and done war. It turns out, you know, it was not supposed to be 34 days. It was not not supposed to be four days, right? Um, This, again, higher chance of Israelis coming home in body bags. This coupled with the CNN effect, which we've talked about before, and I will talk about again, of you know bad media for Israel against you know bringing basically bringing the war into the living rooms of the Israeli population, and Israel society's low tolerance for casualties, and really low interest in this war writ large. All these combined, well, also Israel is a democracy, and what that means is that. Israeli soldiers and Israeli families of soldiers who are tired of this war call up their representative and says, hey, if you want to get reelected, get us out of this war immediately. Hang up the phone. So democracies have this strategic constraint or strategic opportunity, depending how you look at it. But it's regime type matters in warfare. All of these factors combined means that Israel is facing a huge strategic vulnerability that Hezbollah 
understands, understood better than Israeli leadership from the beginning of the war and wished to exploit. The only question for Nasrallah is how can we speed up the cycle? And he has an answer. We're going to bring the war not just into the TV sets of Israeli living rooms. We're going to put Katusha rockets into the living rooms of Israelis as well. We're going to attack the Israeli populations. That's right, civilians. Now, I, as I've said before in this course, we're not talking about the ethics of war, which many see as an oxymoron. Um, we're talking about strategies that work and don't work, and we bracket the important question of ethics. Nasrallah wants to win. He sees that um, a weakness uh, of Israel is its own people. He said that in 2000. He meant it. He's going to attack using Katusha rockets. These are Russian-made or Russian-designed, Iran-made, Syrian-delivered 122-millimeter rockets. They deliver a 30-kilogram payload, which is about 66 pounds. They have a range of about 30 about 30 kilometers, which is about 19 miles. They're dumb weapons. They just fire them. They land wherever, like they're like sort of rocket mortars. They they could do ground based. You can do vehicle based. The, you know the the Toyota Hilux it has always has uses in warfare. So let's look at what what does this look like on the ground. It has just to be clear, its tactical impact is minimal. Its strategic impact is maximal. Uh, they, they, they create terror of random violence, death anywhere, anytime, any place in northern Israel. Se acaban de disparar las alarmas aquí en Haifa. No sé si las pueden ustedes escuchar. Al parecer empiezan a caer misiles catiullas lanzadas por Hezbollah desde el Líbano. La policía aquí cerca está caminando y acá por las calles. Uy. Every night it was on the news. Israeli news. הקטיושה פוגעת בבניין דירות, בלוני הגז מתפוצצים, שרפה ענקית פורצת במקום, הבניין קורס, אנשים לחודים מתחת להריסות. התמונות הנדירות האלה נקלטו במצלמות הערוץ הראשון בחיפה, מתעדות למעשה בפעם הראשונה איך נראית פגיעה ישירה של קטיושה, הכל קורה בתוך פחות מעשר שניות. בהילוך איתי אפשר לראות בבירור את הרקטה בצד הימני העליון של התמונה, פוגעת בבניין והוא עולה באש. שתי שניות אחר כך, קטיושה נוספת נוחתת בעיר, לא רחוק מהנפילה This הראשונה. This generated so much outrage amongst the Israeli population that there were riots in the streets. Uh, protests against the government, uh, signs saying yes to peace, stop the war monstrosity, say no to the brutal bombardments. Even army reservists in uniform joined the protests, which was a first in Israeli history. Um, and so it was an, for Israeli politics, it was a debacle. And, Hez, and Hezbollah pulled off a Sun Tzuian coup, whereas, you know, and which is also Maoist logic. You don't win, right? The supreme art of war is to subdue your enemy without fighting. At the strategic level of war, the way you do this is you, you don't defeat the military on the battlefield. You might be wiped out. But can you convince the people of the foreign country, Israel, to convince the leadership to pull out voluntarily? That is a form of victory. Mao uses it in his protracted war strategy. It's all about Sun Tzu. Get the Israelis to demand the commander-in-chief of the Israel military to retreat. Get them to do your work for you. And they did it with katushas, and they did it with information. So they weaponized information quite well. And we've seen this, and this is not a new idea from Sun Tzu, who says all war is deception, and that's hence he's very heavy on intelligence. 
uh, and using information. T.E. Lawrence, who says that the, the printing press is the greatest weapon in the commander's arsenal. And David Galula, who was fighting these types of wars, understood that controlling the narrative of the conflict is a weapon. It's a center of gravity, especially in this type of warfare. All wars arm politics, so information seeks to impact the political side of warfare. So let's look at this. Israel, again, was thinking in a Clausewitzian frame of mind. The first thing they do is take out the Beirut airport, right? They blow it up. And it's a tactical win. It's an operational win. But it's a huge strategic loss and a self-inflicted one, too, in ways that the conventionally-minded Israelis never thought to consider. How do you think humanitarian supplies from, like, say, you know, from the UNHCR and and NGOs, how do you think they get into Lebanon? How do you think international journalists who are going to tell the story of the conflict, how do they get into Lebanon? There's only one airport, and the Israelis just bombed it. You can imagine how badly this looks from the international community. You have journalists stuck at home in places like New York City, London, Doha, Sydney, wherever, Beijing, writing about this, and they're already taking the side of Hezbollah. So again, Israel thinking like it's sort of, you know, conventionally minded thinkers, uh, Clausewitzian thinkers that there's no problem that force can't solve. And it turns out this they this it just, this turns to backfire. This this Clausewitzian attack or stratagem backfires on them. But the real secret weapon was Al Minar, meaning the beacon. It's a TV station, a Hezbollah TV station that ran throughout this war. It runs in general, um, and it's it does a couple things. One. It denies a victory condition for Israel. So as long as this TV station was up and running, and it was every day of the war, Israel cannot claim victory. It cannot claim it shut down Hezbollah, especially when this video, when this TV station was was a spigot of of propaganda, but showing dead Israeli soldiers, showing you know civilian casualties caused by Israeli attacks, um, and also using it as a platform to disseminate intelligence through to Hezbollah around the area of operation uh, to send disseminate command and control instructions throughout the Hezbollah network. And they could, as hard as Israel tried to find and shut it down, they can never do it because Hezbollah thought it through and had contingency plans for this TV station. Every night, Nasrallah was there shaking his finger uh, and showing B-roll of masses of Hezbollah supporters. What was their narrative? This was their narrative. They turned Israel's narrative on its head and used it against them. It's sort of a, again, like a, a strategic jujitsu move. So throughout Israel's um, Israel history, from forty-seven on, they've always portrayed the narrative that they are David fighting Goliath, whether it be Jews or anti-Semites or Arabs. They are always David, and is and the others are always. Goliath, and here Hezbollah turns it around, saying, "No, Israel is is Goliath now, and Hezbollah is David." And if you think of all the the images that Hezbollah, that Al Manar is pumping, and you think about how journalists around the world, you know, they can't because the Beirut M- airport was bombed, and the humani- humanitarian conditions on the ground were getting worse because there was no humanitarian aid that Al Manar captured and fed to CNN, you can imagine how this captures the so-called CNN effect. The CNN effect is is not, it's named after CNN, but it's quite old. It goes back to the Hearst newspapers and the USS Maine in 1898. I mean, this idea that people read things in the newspapers, they see things in the news that outrages them. And if you're in a democracy, you can get to call up your representative and say, if you want to be reelected, do something now. And the elected official feels like, well, I want to have a career, so I'll do something, even though it's not in the best interest of our country. I'll get involved in this war. I'll, I will not get involved in that war. I'll intervene someplace. Um, this is called the CNN effect, and Hezbollah was trying to capture it, 
And they did. Another stretcher, another body. The ambulances are full of the dead. Children, women, old men. Crushed while hiding in the basement. An Israeli bomb landed right next to a house in the village of Kana, where dozens of women, children and old people had taken shelter. There's a four-month-old baby under the rubble, says Kana resident Riyad Shalhoub. Lebanese army officers say they counted more than 80 strikes on Kana overnight. Large parts of the town have been totally devastated. Those who have come to help pause as another Israeli jet roars overhead. This town was struck just after midnight. The Israeli army says it gave the inhabitants fair warning to leave. Some didn't. So this this video, uh, which aired on CNN, it's even a little bit over the top. And Ben Wiedemann, who did it, got uh, into a little bit of trouble for it. But it, it overall shows the direction of international media, how international media was portraying this conflict. And basically, Hezbollah's narrative was winning out against Israel's. And Israel was not really thinking about the international community. And it itself has a very dubious relationship with the international community. Now, I have a question. Do you think that Hezbollah may have been hiding in these houses? They probably were. Is that against the laws of war? Of course it is. Uh, were they, was Hezbollah violating the laws of war? Indeed, they were. And this, and was there any punishment for Hezbollah? Not really. In fact, if you think about it, whether it's you know Putin grabbing the Crimea or what goes on in the war in Syria or Libya, ask yourself, you know, how relevant are the laws of war anymore? I mean, we see how they put, you know, some like American troops and NATO troops at risk, but they don't seem to uh, benefit uh, strategically anybody, and they don't seem to stop civilian casualties. I mean, looking at looking at this, right? Um, so ask yourself, what is the utility of the laws of war? Um, and, is, and is there a good case for them or not? And if you're going to make a moral argument, um, do so, but from the perspective of the people on the ground, because often those who defend the laws of war the strongest are drinking lattes in The Hague, Geneva, and New York. They're scholars, international lawyers, NGO people. They're not war fighters. Um, so it's an interesting debate to have. All right. Now, Hezbollah also is not immune from problems. They had their own set of problems. One, as you just saw, is when you is weaponizing information, if you go too far, it has blowback. Now, when you're thinking of blowback, the military folks out there, of course, you're thinking of what happens if you're standing behind an RPG get it when it when it's fired, the the fuse, the exhaust, which will you know blow you back and toast you into crispy fried you, um, that's called blowback. But in media, it's a metaphor, which means you do something in the media and it causes you know sort of basically a response back against you that's negative. It's counterproductive, and is a, Hezbollah had a fair degree of blowback. So they got caught photoshopping things, right? They got caught cheating, uh, and they impugned their credibility. So in the, the to the left here is an Israeli jet. It's launching flares uh, to avoid a, a missile, I suppose. And Hezbollah has photoshopped additional missiles, additional flares, and of course has probably portrayed this as Hezbollah's sur surface-to-air missiles taking down Israeli jet. Or they intensify the smoke coming out of Beirut to show that the, the damage and the fire is much greater than it really is. Or how about this? Here's a picture of a dead man and somebody trying to pull him out of the rubble. Here's a few minutes later, a same picture, but this dead man is now alive, staging the next shot. So they got caught staging casualties. And their whole message, of course, is, you know, Israeli forces are causing endless amounts of civilian casualties and needless destruction because they're Goliath, they're brutes. But they got caught and then the CNN effect turns on them. 
um, it, well, on the Hezbollah side, it's, it's really interesting. I was in Beirut, and you know, they took me on this sort of guided tour of the Hezbollah-controlled territories in southern Lebanon that were heavily bombed. Uh, they're much cruder, obviously. They don't have the experience in this kind of thing, but, but they clearly want the story of civilian casualties out. That is their, uh, what they are heavily pushing to the point where on this tour I was on, they were, they were just making stuff up. They had six ambulances lined up in a row uh, and, and said, okay, you know, they brought reporters there. They said, you can talk to the ambulance drivers. Um, and then one by one, they told the ambulances to turn on their, their sirens and to zoom off. Uh, and people taking that picture, you know, would be reporting, I guess, the idea that, you know, these ambulances were zooming off to treat civilian casualties sure. when, in fact, these ambulances were literally going back and forth down the street just for people to take pictures. But remember, ultimately, insurgents, Galula tells us, insurgents and terrorists can lie a lot more than counterinsurgents, than states. States start off with a presumption of legitimacy and hence the, the presumption that they will be honest. Whereas terrorists, it's a very low bar. They can lie through their teeth. And they do. And thanks to globalization, thanks to modern communication, insurgents can pump out more disinformation than governments can stamp it out. And this is a growing problem in warfare around the world. We live in an information age and... Uh, and controlling the narrative of the conflict, defaming your opponent, causing using disinformation, these are ways to win in modern wars. You can weaponize information. This is David Galula speaking 50 to 60 years ago. Think how much communication has changed in just that short time. So who won and why? Well, here's what Nasrallah said after the war. He said, candidly, had we known this would lead, capturing two soldiers would lead to an all-out war with Israel, we would never have done it, right? That's what Nasrallah says. Another way of, of metrics of who won and why is sort of war by the numbers, which is how most board game strategies end or how video games end or you know, how people look at who won World War One and World War Two. So Israel flew, I'll just sum it up, a lot of sorties. They fired a lot of tank rounds. Uh, they committed 15,000 troops to the attack. Uh, only 115 or so Israeli soldiers were killed out of 15,000, which is pretty amazing. And only 37 to 42, 42 Israeli civilians were killed. So think of all those Katusha rockets raining down on cities uh, in, in northern Israel. Only about 40 or so Israeli civilians died, which is frankly not bad. Hezbollah, um, numbers here are less certain, reported by Hezbollah, and there's some you know, IDF intelligence, which may also not be certain. They fired about 4,000 Katusha rockets, mostly into Haifa, which is the northernmost city uh, in Israel. Um, they lost somewhere between 200 and 800 fighters, which is a lot compared to Israel. Um, a lot of civilians died. Around a thousand or so civilians died. Lebanese civilians, not Hezbollah civilians. Lebanese, compared to the forty or so um, Israeli civilians, and you know they had about a three thousand man infantry commando brigade. Plus, they had some militia. So, if you compare these two, who gets to declare victory? Well, under sort of. Clausewitzian, Germanian, conventional war uh, logic, Israel wins, right? I mean, the, the sort of the conventional war logic is this, is that you capture the, the side that captures the most ter enemy territory, kills the most enemy, and flies their, flies their flag over the enemy's capital. That's the winner. Israel did all those things. It did every one of those things, but it still lost. Israel lost this war. Even Israel will tell you that. Even they will tell you that. Here is why they lost. Well, first of all, they lost because the character of warfare is changing and strategies uh, like Clausewitz and Germany have become less effective. I'm not saying they're obsolete. They're just becoming less effective. And other strategies such as Sun Tzu and Mao are becoming more effective in an information age. 
So but Israel also lost for some other basic reasons. One, as any intel officer will tell you, if you start off <clears throat> with a bad threat assessment, then you will get bad strategy. And Israel's strategic assessment of Hezbollah, which is frankly shot from the hip, was wrong. They, they assumed that, had that since, like Klausfitzian law, logic here, that because Israel had the best military in the world, that if they declared war in Hezbollah, there, there's no way Hezbollah would survive. So that Hezbollah would crumble under the weight of an immediate intent of military strike. But this had four bad, at least four bad assumptions baked in. <clears throat> One is that it assumed that Hezbollah did nothing in its southern Lebanon between 2000 when Israel pulled out and 2006 when Israel went back in. They assumed Hezbollah was standing still. Why did they make this assumption? Because they were Israeli intelligence was mirroring. Their eye, they were not focused on Lebanon anymore, and they assumed nobody else was focused on Lebanon either. But that was wrong. Hezbollah was digging in to southern uh, southern Lebanon the way that the French dug in with making the Maginot Line. Israel also assumed that the era of ground expeditionary warfare was over for them. They assumed that, you know, these tank battles, the Merkava was really designed to deal with Arab, the Arab wars of 67 and 72, 73. It was not, uh, <clears throat> uh, or 73. It was not designed for um, this type of warfare. And they assumed that they were dealing with counterterrorism issues. In the last 15 years, from 1990 to even to this day, they're dealing more and more with terrorism inside their borders uh, that are sponsored by Hamas, the PLO before it imploded, or Hezbollah. So the IDF became a really a domestic counterterrorism unit, and they, they stopped training on these ground expeditionary warfare strategies that they needed for South Lebanon. And lastly, they believe that you can control territory from the sky based on the experience of Kosovo, based on what America is pushing with effects-based operations. Curiously, after this war, America dropped effects-based operations. Um, they quietly did it. It was General Mattis at GIFCOM. He was in charge of GIFCOM, then a COCOM at that, at that time, which doesn't long, does no longer exists. Um, some people still believe in effects-based operations. They are holdouts mostly at the U.S. Air Force War College in Montgomery, Alabama. But this idea, and people have tried it since then. Uh, President Obama tried it in Libya in 2011, predictably it achieved nothing. Um, you can't hold territory from the sky. The second big problem was the failure to comprehend what victory looks like. So if you don't know what victory looks like, you can't make a correct strategy to achieve it. Here, there's even a bigger problem. Prime Minister Olmert said on international TV these things. Victory for us looks like this. We're going to get those two soldiers back. We want a complete ceasefire. We want Hezbollah to forever withdraw from South Lebanon. And we want... We want Lebanon government to govern in South Lebanon. We want them to be a responsible state partner. And now, if you're if you're Nasrallah hearing this in your you know TV lounge in Beirut, you must be kicking up your popcorn because all you've got to do now to win is you just got to deny Israel just one of those factors, just one of those conditions. And think about it: how hard is it to hide? two captured soldiers. How hard is it to, in a whole country? It's not hard at all. And they never got those soldiers back. Israel finally got the remains of those soldiers back, I think in 2014. Um, they also wanted a complete ceasefire. They wanted all these things. Israel got none of them. And for these reasons, they can't declare victory. And even if they tried to spin it, you've got the Hezbollah press machine, which is much more adept at spinning press than Israel is. Also, third, there's an ends ways means mismatch going on from the beginning. So for Israel, so they set victory conditions that were unattainable by military force 
And then Israel launches a military campaign to attain them. That is a classic ends ways means mismatch, which dooms failure. And as a result, you know, does this sound familiar to anybody? Israel won all the battles, but they lost the war. You know, all Hezbollah had to do was sit back and wait for Israel to fail. Because Israel was thinking strategically that war is armed politics. Everything that Israel, that Hezbollah was doing was primarily aimed at punching Israel at the strategic level of war. Think about the Katusha rockets. Think about uh, just to soften the the population back at home. Think about the use of Alman RTV. You can't, you know, think about all these things. It wasn't really to to engage in single, you know, one-on-one -on -one combat with, with Israeli tanks. They were too smart for that. They were playing uh, armed politics when Israel was playing battlefield uh, victory. So it was a Maoist victory. It was a Maoist victory. Israel did leave of its own accord. The cost became too great for them. You know, and, and he's not alone. I mean, Kissinger would also agree with this. Say, hey, you know, Israel, what were you thinking? Israel itself knew it had lost the war, and it launched shortly thereafter the Winograd Commission. The Winograd Commission's mission, it was sort of like the 9-11 Commission in the United States, it was to figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. And it was named Winograd after, I think, a retired chief justice of their Supreme Court who led it. And in a nutshell, this is what they concluded, and you can read more about this in the readings, that basically when the strongest military in the Middle East you know, embarks in a fight against Hezbollah and they lose, it has far-reaching consequences for Israel and not good ones. And he is right. He is right. Israel, for 10 years, hand-wringing over, over 2006. It's not a debate in, in Israel anymore. I think in 2006, that autumn, it was a debate. Did we win? Did we lose? But I think the Israelis are pretty clear-eyed when it comes to these things, unlike, say, other countries. They're pretty, because they kind of feel like they have to be, that they are always on the brink of total war. And showing that they are learning military, 10 years later, they came out with this report. Well, sorry, they came up with a new defense strategy called deterring, well, we call it deterring terror. But um, you, you can read the translation. It's online. I have it uh, in my web, uh, my course website. Um, and it basically talks about how do you fight wars beneath the threshold of war? Uh, and this is a strategic conundrum for them. I think Hezbollah and for many others, it's not a strategic conundrum at all. That's just war for them. But for, for Israel, it comes up with this idea of what they call the campaign between the wars. And I encourage you to read especially that section and think, do you think, does that work? Is that strategically viable or not? Hezbollah also made their victory clear by Hezbollah gloating, which you can imagine from a, a basically an information power, right? And note the language choice here and where it's located. They put this in some of the worst hit places uh, in southern Lebanon <clears throat> so that tourists and journalists could take pictures and tweet about it, right? This is this is smart. This is smart on Hezbollah's part with their branding, uh, their, their image, their symbols. Information is a weapon of war more than any other time, and it's the weapon that really attacks the politics side of war, not the armed. So you can have the most advanced fighter jets in the world and the best aircraft carriers in the world, but unless you also deal with the political components of war, you're not going to win. And to some extent, all of the theorists we've looked at in this course say this very same thing. Clausewitz famously says war is politics by other means. And while everybody in the Pentagon can recite it in their sleep, they really don't know how to apply it in war if the last 70 years are any evidence at all. All of these thinkers have a different answer exactly to how to apply this in war. Some, like Sun Tzu, differ a lot than Clausewitz, that differ a lot from Katilia versus Mao, etc., or Galula. But they all agree that wars are in politics, and if you are to win the war, you must win them both. Now, uh, a curiosity, perhaps a monstrosity, uh, is that Hezbollah has made its own sort of war memorial, which they call a museum, which you could look at as a theme park. 
that really perpetuates their narratives, the same narratives during the war. They, they want to, if you will, dine off of that as long as they can. And who's to say they should not? Uh, and they even have their own video game. This is the sick part. Talk about winning hearts and minds of the next generation. Here you are. You're a brave Hezbollah jihadi warfighter killing the evil Goliath of Israel. You could fight, fire your own Katusha rockets. Um, you may, look, you can you can take the enemy's you know M15, M16s, M4s. You could do all sorts of things um, if you can still find this video. It's about ten years old, I think. So in conclusion, Hezbollah 2006 war, the Israel-Hezbollah war, is a curious war because in some ways it points towards the future. And in fact, if you look at all the wars in, the, in recent years, from this war to uh, Ukraine in 2014, Syria, um, Nagorno-Karabakh, Libya, these are all kind of pointing to the future of war, and it doesn't look conventional. In some ways, all these wars are a little bit like the Spanish Civil War before World War II. It points to the way ahead, and that's why we should take some time out to study them, uh, to see what they might tell us about our future and how that might impact politics globally in 2030, 2040, and beyond. So... In conclusion, here are some brain teasers. To what degree does this case portend the changing character of modern warfare? Do armed non-state actors change the character of war just by their present? Does this change strategic outcomes, ends, ways, and means? If so, how and why? And can they exploit it? Can their adversaries exploit it? We need better strategies. Some, it, some of the best weapons do not fire bullets today. Do you agree with the statement or not? And talk about how information was used or not used during this case study as a tool, an instrument of war. How important is ideology and legitimacy in this conflict? And also, how important were the laws of war? Did anybody in Hezbollah get punished? How important was the utility of force for the victor? Clearly, the utility of force favored Israel, but it did not win. And we're seeing this over and over again, whether it's the U.S. and Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere. You know, having the most bullets does not guarantee victory. And strategically, what do you think Klosfitz might have advised Israel? What would Sun Tzu advise Israel? And do you think it would have helped Israel win? I leave you with these brain teasers. If you have any more questions, please check out my website. You can email me. This is my private email. I write about this type of warfare extensively in my book, The New Rules of War. Turn to that. It's a very readable book. It's not an academic dry tome. Um, and I hope that you take this and other wars seriously, because I think this has a lot to teach us about what our world's going to look like 15, 20, 50 years from now. This is Dr. Sean McFate. Until next time.